I invented this word technocalypse to describe what seemed to me a process that I could observe around me. Technocalypse meaning the convergence of two seemingly unrelated things, the apocalyptic imagination which has been around for centuries and the rise of modern technology. And the connection seems to be this. The apocalyptic imagination is based on one fundamental idea and that is that human life on earth and earth itself and very ex all existence is going to be transformed through the influence of a divine intervention now that idea seems to be deeply rooted in human consciousness but what is interesting is that we now have the technology to translate some of those fundamental dreams those octopal visions of the human species into reality the difference of course is that it is we human beings that are transforming the earth and transforming ourselves. That's the surprise of history, that a vision that began as a prophetic and religious vision now seems to be in the process of being appropriated by humanity itself. And that convergence is what I mean by technocalypse. Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, Edwin Buzz Aldrin. Three men to represent the culmination of a dream and the beginning of a new concept of reality. I look at space exploration, artificial intelligence, nuclear weapons, cyberspace, and genetic engineering as all essentially religious projects. I spent some weeks at the archives in NASA where the archivist had, simply out of his own interest, collected a great volume of documents about religion, and no one had ever looked at it before. And as I was reading it, I got more and more terrified, really, because uh, the, the otherworldly aspect of the space program, uh, the, the uh, let's say, divine pretensions, The origins of manned spaceflight in Russia, it goes back to Tsiolkovsky, who preached that it was mankind's destiny to dominate the cosmos and become reunited with God, and that space exploration uh, was the means to that end. And he was really the father of modern rocketry. In the United States, uh, von Braun, the Nazi rocket scientist who was brought here, he became a born-again Christian and he argued that human beings must go into space as part of their cosmic destiny to spread the gospel. So they rose through the atmosphere toward the open vacuum, a journey that was to be a door to the future and a window on the past. The first manned space flight, which later became Mercury, was originally called Project Atom. And then when NASA was set up in 1957, it was, the name was changed. In fact, in Huntsville, it was always called Project Mercury, and then parentheses, Adam. When Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong were waiting on the moon before Armstrong stepped out onto the moon to take mankind's first steps on another celestial body, Buzz Aldrin, who was a Catholic, had prepared a little box with communion wafers and blessed wine that his priest had blessed for him. And he actually said to NASA Control, could we have a moment's silence so that he could take communion wafers and communion wine before Armstrong stepped out on the moon. And it's interesting to note that the first food and drink ever taken on the moon was communion wafers and wine. And the NASA hierarchy were completely um, encouraging of this kind of thing. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The astronauts have carried literally thousands of Christian banners, flags, microfilmed copies of the Bible, etc., into space with them in their spacesuits. So the religious ethos of the space program, I think, is undeniable. So they went about their tasks of exploration, aliens on a distant world. And strangely enough, they looked as if they belonged there. The Human Genome Project, which is the largest technological enterprise of, of our day, 
Francis Collins, who runs it, is a born-again uh, Christian, an evangelical, very outspoken, who has written that he thinks the most important event in history is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says that he will allow for God to intervene in the laws of nature, etc. The human genome uh, doesn't really exist because everyone's genome is different. And when asked whose genome it would be, uh, they said, well, it would be sort of a um, composite. And uh, it would be male. And they said it would be sort of an atom too. Richard Seed, who announced rather defiantly that he was going to clone human beings, went on to the radio and the television. And this is what he said. And I have a tape of this. He said to the whole world, God made man in his own image. God intended for man to become one with God. We are going to become one with God. Cloning and the reprogramming of DNA is the first serious step in becoming one with God. Yes. We are going to become gods. Period. Technological development, which appears to be the most worldly of activities, is in actuality an otherworldly project rooted in the Christian notion of redemption, uh, the restoration of original perfection. And the story, which is a peculiar Christian one, is the story of the fall of Adam and the, the promise of a recovery of Adam's original divinity. Science is the ultimate authority in our culture, and scientists cultivate the image that they stand between mortals and God, and that they are the new clergy, so to speak. The notion that science and religion were enemies is really a historical myth. In fact, for most of our history, science and religion have been intimately entwined. The first time you have a really major separation between science and religion is when Darwin put forward his thesis that man was descended from apes and not made in the image of God. That caused a huge tension between science and religion. And in the late 19th century, a mythology was in fact created that science and religion had always been at war, which in fact is a historical myth. So why not get it all out on the table? Okay, you want to pursue genetic engineering because human beings, as the image likeness of the god, have the right to create new species, transgenic species, participate in creation, a new creation, a, a second genesis. That's our birthright. That, that's what was promised to Adam. Okay, if that's true, if that's what we're about, let's say that's what we're doing. Okay, and stop all this talk about, oh, this is, we're doing this for medical reasons. Okay. The Industrial Revolution took place in the Christian West, so it's not surprising that most religious theories trying to deal with these changes are rooted in the Christian tradition. But now that the whole world is confronted with modern technology, people within other traditions also seek answers to the implications of modernity and how to reconcile technology with their own beliefs. Their reflections might give us an idea about how the world would react to the prospect of a transhuman future. To be the data, the code, the communications, forever, amen. Turing, von Neumann, Ada Lovelace, Babbage, Around me shines the bits, and in me is the bite. Raphael, Gabriel, Uriel, Mikael. For we, the data, the code, the communications, forever, amen. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke once said that uh, any uh, sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. But I think that's actually the wrong way around. I think that we're trying to achieve magic through technology. 
Magic uh, is in many ways the idea that uh, we can control the world around us. And of course, this is what technology is about. But what people usually call magic is more close to the pre-rational idea that everything is connected with me. That is the view of a small child. But uh, as we grow up, we realize that things happen that are not connected to uh, us. But through technology, we can still achieve these changes uh, we want. We want to go up uh, in a high building, we use the elevator, which is really a magical means. Modern life starts to look like a fairy tale where everything is alive. Our environment is full of demonic devices that we command with remote controls and credit cards as our magic wands and with passwords and fingerprints as our magic spells. Virtual reality gives a foretaste of how this manner of commanding, of mastering the world around us, will further evolve. There's a basic rule in magic, which is that your will, what you will to be, is the thing that you see, is what shapes your worldview. Well, that's literally true in cyberspace. What you will to see is what is true for you. When I'm trying to teach people about the evolution of the computer interface, I tell them that the first generation of computing, which is the one-dimensional computer interface, or the interface that we would commonly associate with, say, systems like Unix systems, where everything's on the command line. In fact, what happens is to learn how to master that interface, you have to become an initiate in the mysteries of that language. You have to go study under someone who's normally called a guru. All right? And you have to learn the magical incantations. So you spend months and months with this person, you learn their incantations. And from that you gain a mastery of the system. You know how to make the system do your will. It turns out that my greatest magical teacher was also the man who instructed me in Unix. But this practical magic, imposing your will on the world and manipulating it according to your own desires, is not exclusive to cyberspace. Once nanotechnology comes into the picture, our whole life will start to look magical. Nanotechnology would enable us to reshape the physical uh, matter in the world almost uh, in the same ease we can do in a virtual world. So matter will be a, a virtual medium, just uh, like virtual reality. And that means you can change it according to will, just like uh, the magical view of the world. You decide that uh, I don't like this furniture and uh, you order your nanomachines through some interface, be it a magical spell or just programming on a computer. It might look the same uh, if somebody has designed the user interface that way, and you get the desired change. If the physical world becomes as easy to transform as the virtual one, a magical worldview might become the most suitable. According to Hinduism, however, we already live in a kind of virtual reality. Hindus see our world as a phantom, as a veil, or maya in Sanskrit, that covers the real world and that hinders us from seeing it. In other words, this could be a simulation running on a universal computer. At the top level, there is God, who you could say is the ultimate programmer. Then you have the universal form, uh, Virat Purusha, it's called in Sanskrit, which would correspond to the operating system. And then you have the world as we see it, which is a virtual reality controlled by that operating system. And finally, you have many individual beings who are in the virtual reality, but their actual self is external to the virtual reality. You could say in one sense that Maya is a kind of virtual reality, a world of illusion, which is intended basically as an educational system for the souls. Hindu people believe that the soul is separate from the body, that it leaves the body after death, and then reincarnates in another body. What body you will reincarnate into depends on how well you develop your mind in your present life. 
There is a strict hierarchy of all creatures, and among humans, that is reflected in their rigid caste system. But Hindus also believe that there are higher beings that are already living now, and you can become one of them in your next life if you improve yourself considerably at the present stage. There's no question of the entire society of organisms progressing to a higher stage, because the higher stage actually is already in existence. We are actually inherently beings of a higher nature than simply the limited human uh, state. Individuals can progress to higher and higher stages of consciousness, which enable them to participate in higher and higher levels within this hierarchy. This self-improvement is done by yoga practice. There are 64 steps in yoga, called the 64 cities, that ultimately allow you to break through the veil of this reality and bring you in contact with the world behind it. The word city in Sanskrit means perfection. But traditionally this refers to certain capacities that the individual acquires as a result of yogic practices. Imagine that you're in a virtual reality, but you find a way of gaining access to the operating system. You would gain powers that would be very remarkable from the point of view of life within the virtual reality. Well, the concept is that the yogi can do this. Now the siddhis tend to correspond to what one would call supernatural powers. Uh, one of the simplest would be mind-to-mind -mind communication. And you could say that well modern technology has imitated that through radio. Likewise the yoga siddhis would involve the ability to travel to a distant place in a very easy and convenient way. And you could say that well uh, technology has developed the airplane and the automobile so in one sense, you could say the material technology imitates the result that people used to talk about through the uh, development of yoga. The analogies between Hinduism and transhuman ideas are so apparent that the prospect of a technological transhuman future will most likely not pose much of a problem for Hindu people. Well, would it be possible for a soul or a conscious self to become linked up with a, a computer? Maybe it is possible. If the self can be linked up with a brain made of protoplasm, or wetware as it's called, then the soul may be able to link itself with another kind of material organization. Nevertheless, it is precisely these similarities that may limit Hindu interest in technological progress. If you focus on external development, then you may create a very nice external structure. It may even be an artificially intelligent computer but you won't ultimately be able to enjoy that because that's something external to yourself. Whereas if you focus on internal development, you may be able to elevate your consciousness to the point where you yourself become a super intelligent being. So in that sense, all uh, effort to develop external technology ultimately benefits something other than the self of the individual. In the Far East today, people seem to embrace technology, but this has not always been the case. In East Asia, there was a sort of nativist reaction against science introduced by the West. Science, again, had universalist claims. The scientific truth based on reason has to be universal. And then a nativist reaction would say, you know, this is threatening our traditions. Um, the Middle Kingdom is in the middle center of the universe. The emperor is the center of the cosmos. Uh, all these new ideas coming in with Copernicus and so on, upsetting the established order. Another reaction is to say, well, we're backward economically and, and, and otherwise. The Western world is clearly superior in military might and threatening to dominate us. So what we need to do is reject the reasons for our backwardness, which are our own traditions and so on, and adopt science. And science became uh, almost a new religion. Um, the two slogans were Mr. Science and Mr. Democracy. Technology has boomed in the East since then, especially in Japan, which is probably the most technophiliac nation in the world. This enthusiasm seems to be rooted in some particular elements of the Buddhist and Shintoist tradition. There is a strong 
basis in Christianity and also in, in Western humanism, this idea that the human has a unique soul. A rock doesn't have a soul, a human does, and man is made in the image of God and so on. Whereas uh, in a more animist tradition like the Japanese one, Many things can have so, and many things can be sacred, including rocks and other inanimate objects. So there is less of a transgression, perhaps, for them in the idea that a machine can be brought to life. <laughs> the interesting case is Japan because it's so advanced in, in robot technology and even on the level of games and virtual reality, the Japanese and the Koreans are way ahead. In our attitude toward everything surrounding us, we are tended to find a living uh, spirit, not only in our human beings, animals, but also everything under the sun. So new technologies, uh, such as robotics or some new machines. We try to relate those even machines and robots, they have their own souls or minds. In the West, most legends about technology, like that of Icarus or Frankenstein, carry the negative message that humans should refrain from trying to defy the gods. In the East, such negative associations are completely absent. We have a lot of heroes or heroines, very friendly robots, which are a part of our society. For example, Ultra Boy, you know, Atom, who is a kind of man-made robot which is always helping us when we fight against some evil. Uh, but they are always trying to realize the dreams of young children. They use some magic and uh, you know they are ushering us into the futuristic world so we have an image or perception that those machines and uh, new technologies are always uh, enriching our life this positive attitude towards robots in their collective imagination is also reflected in their actual robots while western robots are basically built for military and industrial purposes Eastern robots are often made for providing pleasure and care. This acceptance of modern technology within Eastern religion has found its most prominent propagator in the Dalai Lama. From an early age on, the Dalai Lama has shown great interest in science. He has collaborated in several brain research projects. He claims that he would give up his religious beliefs as soon as they would contradict scientific evidence, and even the prospect of a transhuman future doesn't pose a problem for him. Once he claimed that he might reincarnate into a computer as soon as these machines were powerful enough. Now, further development of the technology, and eventually, a new type of human being, uh, uh, say, due to these machines, something, uh, then welcome, no problem. If that come, and then, then the reincarnation of the Lama also may be one of like that. <laughs> <laughs> A religion in which science has played an important role from its very origins is Islam. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad proclaimed that God could be known through science. Islam emphasized the fact that we can know God. Christianity in the past has uh, emphasized on the mystery 
of God. God is a mystery. Yes, of course, there are mysterious aspects of God that we cannot know. But still, Islam emphasizes the fact that we can know God. First of all, by studying Revelation, which means by studying the Quran. That is one way. But Muslims also believe, based on the Quran itself, that through knowledge of the universe, we can know God. Because God manifests Himself in the universe. God gives many, many signs. In the Quran, more than 750 out of the 6,000 verses are dealing with nature and the urge to study nature through science. This encouragement gave rise to an unprecedented flourishing of knowledge in the centuries after the Prophet. Between 800 and 1500, when Europe retreated into itself and its religion, the Islamic world was the Mecca of science and wisdom. One thousand years ago, algebra was developed in Baghdad. Hospitals are a Muslim invention. They even had functioning robots, automated puppets that could play music, show the time, or even pour wine. Alcohol is an Arabic word. They invented the distillation process. The Arabic world was cosmopolitan, tolerant, and curious. But by the time their knowledge leaked out to Europe, giving rise to the European Renaissance, the Arabic world closed itself off into its own religion, and the Arabic Golden Age faded away. After the 16th century, Islamic science declined. Why? A number of religious scholars came to believe that Religious sciences were more important than the natural sciences and the social sciences. And these scholars were influential in Muslim society. So Muslims paid more attention to religious sciences than to natural and social sciences. In the course of time, science declined. Although the Quran describes science and religion as two parallel paths towards the same goal, the religious path has dominated during the last 500 years. In the last few decades, several Muslim countries have acquired great wealth. Agricultural regions turned into megacities within a time span of one generation. But there's little scientific research conducted in these countries compared to other regions with the same affluence. The revival of the sciences has not yet taken place. There are various things that have held the Arab world back. Um, one of them, arguably, is the um, fact that they're so oil rich which means that money flows into the coffers of the ruling elite, whether they have a modern economy or not. Whereas uh, for the Japanese, for example, there are very few natural resources. They had to build a modern economy and an industry and so on, uh, because otherwise they wouldn't have survived in the modern world. Whereas in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia and so on, the elite survives very well just by selling oil. So I think that's one thing that's kept them back. Another thing is that you need to, to build a modern economy you do need a kind of bourgeoisie um, and with a certain amount of economic freedom. There is clearly pressure from a rising middle class to push governments into more political and economic liberties. And if they succeed in having more open societies, more liberal regimes, they could indeed start catching up in the way that they are in India. Um, Turkey is already an example of this. Indonesia. And Malaysia, Malaysia is already quite rich. Indonesia is not doing so badly. So, I mean, it can easily happen. Uh, it depends entirely on what happens politically. In the past few decades, modern technology has entered the Muslim world, but it became integrated only for its practical uses, without affecting much of Muslim tradition. However, the demand to reopen the discussion between science and religion has surfaced in the past few years, and not only among intellectuals. The internet is full of discussion groups dealing with what is called Islamic science, the reconciliation of science with the Quran. The discussion often refers back to its roots in the Golden Age, but the old position, that science and religion are two separated paths, has to be reviewed as technology today starts to fulfill what the Prophet had predicted, that we can know God through science. There are debates going on in Muslim societies, and these debates are good because I think in a matter of time, hopefully, some very clear positions will emerge about the relationship between Islam and science.
After a thousand years of absence, new robots appear in the Arabic world. In the famous camel races of Qatar, the camels, previously mounted by children because of their light weight, are now run by even lighter robots. The Jewish community never made a real functioning robot during the Middle Ages, but they did produce a legend about a robot, the Golem, and that story still seems to play an inspirational role in the scientific community of today. In that building over there, in the classical Aleph, I know at least four people who claim to, set, to be descendants of Rabbi Lu, who is known as the first Kabbalist who actually built a, built a golem. Rabbi Lu lived in Prague in the 15th or 16th century, and there are a couple of different stories about his golem. And one story is when the golem died, he put the dead golem in the attic of the Prague synagogue, and he created a sentence to revive the golem at the end of all times. And a couple of people in that building, including Marvin Minsky, have been told that sentence on the day of the Bar Mitzvah. So they have been told by their fathers or grandfathers that they would be the ones who would revive the golem. And of course, then you can easily draw the parallel to AI, right? You have, if you want to revive the golem, okay, you build an AI system. two people who actually claim to be descendants. One is Jerry Sussman, a professor here, and the other one is Joel Moses, who is right now provost of MIT. We're sitting together and they wrote the sentence they have learned to revive the goal on a piece of paper. It was absolutely the same. So this tradition has actually survived for 400 years. And for me, it's just interesting that, that this element is so strong in the AI community. I just stopped to say hi. And there is one story where the golem comes to life and has on its forehead the terms Yahweh Elohim Emet, which means God the Lord is truth. And he comes to life and removes the Aleph, the first letter of the word uh, term Emet, from his forehead, so that the re remaining sentence means uh, God the Lord is dead. And uh, the, his builders, of course, are totally horrified and say, what's, what's going on? I mean, how can you say God is dead? And he says, well, we are created in God's image and we adore God because God was able to build something so fantastic as us. But if you are not able to rebuild yourself, the people will adore you for building that and not God anymore. But as soon as God is not adored anymore, he might as well be dead. The Orthodox Hasidic community believes that the end of human life on earth is near. At that moment, the new Messiah will come just as all knowledge of God is known and the world will be filled with the Word of God. The acceleration in technology's advances seems to indicate that this moment is approaching. To speed up the event, Rabbi Yusuf Kazan took the initiative to put the Holy Scripts online. The prophecy of Isaiah is that the time will come when the world will be filled with the knowledge of God just as the ocean covers the sea. And it's a prophecy which was said by Isaiah many, many years ago. We today are able to actually see this happen. Today you have the Iridium satellites which are bringing the entire world connected into one small unit where telephone technology, wireless technology is being able to bring everybody together. This is something unheard of and undreamt of in the past. But these were prophecies which we heard of from our sages. And just as we heard those prophecies and we're seeing their fulfillment and their happening, so will the other prophecies happen where we know that the coming of Mashiach and the coming of the Messiah will happen. Technology is enabling us to actually see this happen. <laughs> The earlier periods of history, and we have, say, 
three pretty good-sized messiahs between 600 BC and 700 AD. We have Buddha, we have Christ, we have Muhammad. Um, produced over the whole planet, more or less, a system of the self. It's not clear that this unification of the self around what we would call probably today ego in Freudian language was fully formed before that period of time. And the interesting thing is, is that Buddha both invokes the ego and then contradicts it and says, don't go there. All right, it exists, and here I am making you conscious of it, but this is how you free yourself of it. Christ does the same thing, and Christ says that the way to freedom from ego is through love. And Buddha says that it's through non-attachment. So this produces what we would call modern materialistic culture. You know, it takes some time to work through culture, and culture evolves and iterates through it, and so we now have modern materialistic culture in which the ego is prized above all other developments. Well, that game is over. But the software upgrade is not coming through the manifestation of a person. Not so much in the form of a person or a teaching, but I would almost say the Internet is the Messiah. You know, Marshall McLuhan said uh, that the age of the Holy Ghost would be manifest by the descent of electricity over the entire planet. He identified electricity with third person of the Trinity. In that sense, then, we are now living in the age of the Holy Spirit, and the Internet is its vessel. The concept that a global network of human beings will result in an entity of higher form is an idea that originates in the theories of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Teilhard was a Jesuit priest who was also a scholar dedicated to the study of the evolution of men. This combination of interests gave rise to his philosophical work in which he attempted to reconcile Christianity with Darwinism. Through his scientific research he saw that life was evolving to ever more complex forms. At the beginning, there was no life on Earth, only dead matter, the geosphere. But out of this dead matter, life evolved, creating a new layer, the biosphere on top of the geosphere. This life evolved to ever more complex animals with more complex nervous systems until we arrive at humans, the first species with a reflective consciousness. For Teilhard, however, there is no reason to believe that evolution would stop at the level of human beings. We are just the first step of a new layer on top of the biosphere, the sphere of thoughts and reflection, which he called the noosphere. We are the building blocks that will evolve to higher unities of consciousness. And when this evolution is traced further to infinity, all life will finally unite into one complex conscious entity that Teilhard called the Omega Point, or God. Human population has spread over the world, transforming the biosphere into a conscious sphere. Some theorists now identify the internet, which turns the world into one global village, as the first step to merge all human consciousness into such higher form of complexity. It might seem a rather far-fetched interpretation of what telecommunication offers today, but there are some people, even within the scientific community, who consider the merging of our consciousness to be plausible in the future. If you have a hundred people who each are good at different things, maybe you should make one bigger one that uh, has the best parts of all that. So once people are machines, you could say, why don't we combine these and condense it and make it more elegant? So uh, we have to have a new idea about existence. The person who formulated this idea in its most elaborate form is Frank Tipler. Life is basically computing. So what we should think of this life in the far future as being computers. The real essence of life, however, is not the hardware, but the software, the programs in the computers. For example, we humans might decide to upload ourselves into computer memory banks, which will then go out and colonize nearby stars. They will be virtual humans, not humans at the lowest level of reality, which is what we now are, but you might think of a spiritualized aspect of ourselves. This is solid science, 
but now science and religion have become intertwined. I can use either language, scientific language or religious language, to describe exactly the same thing. Human beings in the far future will be primarily virtual humans. And it is those virtual humans that will get into tiny spaceships and travel to the distant stars, colonize those nearby stars, start the same process again. What will happen is the universe will be slowly but surely converted from its current dead matter state into a living matter state. In the far future, the entire universe will be one gigantic computing machine. Tipler believes that at the end of times, the whole universe will become one cosmic computer network. Whether this is plausible depends on how the universe will further evolve. Since the Big Bang, the universe has been expanding farther and farther. Stars are moving away from each other and lose their energy. After a while, the distances will be so great that communication between different places in the universe will become impossible. Finally, everything will fall apart in dust. Atoms will disintegrate into smaller parts until nothing more is left. But Tipler believes that this will never be the case. According to the law of gravitation, matter attracts matter, and this is slowing down the expansion. Tipler calculated that there is enough matter in space to stop the expansion and reverse it, so that the universe will start contracting again. As time proceeds further, the universe begins to collapse. Life extracts gravitational energy until finally the entire biosphere evolves into the omega point. Now the omega point is not in time. It is not in space. It's beyond space and time. It's the ultimate limit. The omega point is omniscient. It knows everything that can be known. It has infinite power. We can call it omnipotent and it exists throughout all space. We can call it omnipresent. So I can identify the omega point with God. Tipler gives us a clear concept of God. It is an intelligent computer network, a network that will enclose the whole universe. It will contract to a single point, but according to the relativity theory, when space becomes zero, time and energy will become endless. This minuscule but cosmic computer network will live in eternity with eternal energy. And the good news is that it will be able to save us all. The resources available to life in the far future will be so great that they can bring us back into existence, each individual person, as a computer emulation, as a perfect simulation. And that will be you, you and me, reborn, resurrected, to use the ancient religious terminology. We will be resurrected in time by these super beings. Think of us in religious terms as being resurrected by the angels. Now then, once we are resurrected, we will never have uh, to die again. So, according to Tipler, God will be at the end of all times, but he is already present today, because as he is beyond space and time, he is able to turn back in time. And that is what Tipler believes God sometimes does. He leaves messages for us, telling us what we should do to create him. The crucial verse of the Bible, Moses asked God for his name, and in Exodus 3.14, God replies in Hebrew, Ehye asher ehye. I shall be who I shall be. Future tense. God was telling Moses in the very beginning that he has to be thought of as future tense. Now that is how the Omega Point, who exists in the ultimate future, affects the universe now. By logical necessity, the universe has to do certain things now in order to force it into this pattern, in order to force it into the Omega Point in the ultimate future. And it has to evolve that way if, grossly speaking, the laws of physics are to be consistent. 
Another person who in his thinking combines the prospect of a transhuman era with the biblical tradition is the contemporary prophet Rael. Rael is a former race car driver whose life changed completely after he was visited by aliens. Le 13 décembre, au matin, j'allais à mon bureau et j'ai quelque chose qui m'a poussé à continuer jusqu'à un volcan euh, éteint. Et là, j'ai stoppé ma voiture et à pied, je suis allé au centre du cratère où je n'avais absolument rien à faire. Et là, euh, j'ai regardé le ciel et j'ai vu une lumière clignotante très, très violente. Et doucement, quelque chose est descendu et une trappe s'est dépliée. Et là, un être est sorti. Et il m'a expliqué par la suite qu'il était un des Elohim qui sont venus il y a très longtemps créer la vie sur Terre. Voilà comment ça a commencé. Et le mot lui-même Elohim est très important. Il est le mot qui est dans la Bible. Et euh, chose choquante pour les gens à qui j'explique cela, la Bible est le plus ancien livre athée du monde. Il n'y a pas de Dieu dans la Bible. Il y a le mot Elohim qui en hébreu veut dire « ce » qui sont venus du ciel. Évidemment, pour tout être primitif, ce qui vient du ciel, c'est Dieu. Mais nous commençons à voyager dans l'espace, nous commençons à nous échapper de cette petite planète bleue, et, et nous sommes en train de comprendre qu'il peut, peut y avoir de la vie sur d'autres planètes, que cette vie peut, tout comme nous, voyager, et donc qu'on peut venir du ciel sans forcément être un dieu. Alors, les Elohim nous expliquent qu'ils avaient atteint, il y a très longtemps, le même niveau à peu près le même niveau de technologie que nous avons maintenant sur Terre, et qu'ils ont connu les mêmes problèmes que les scientifiques sur la Terre connaissent actuellement. Quels sont ces problèmes Tous les éthicistes, les comités d'éthique, les gens qui sont bloqués par des concepts religieux primitifs et qui, et qui disent « vous n'avez pas le droit de cloner, vous n'avez pas le droit d'utiliser les fœtus parce que c'est vivant, vous n'avez pas le droit de... » tout un tas de, de considérations religieuses ou philosophiques qui n'ont rien à voir avec la science, mais qui la freinent ou qui la bloquent. Et ils ont demandé à leur gouvernement, laissez-nous aller ailleurs. Nous allons aller sur une autre planète, on pourra poursuivre nos recherches, nos expériences, et ça leur a été accordé. Ils ont choisi la Terre. Et c'est comme ça qu'ils sont venus créer toute vie sur Terre, en commençant par des animaux euh, monocellulaires, puis pluricellulaires, puis, des, puis finalement, comme le dit la Bible, l'homme à leur image. Ils disent, on les a fait à notre image, un jour ils vont être capables de faire la même chose que nous. Et ils nous aiment. Ils sont admiratifs devant leur création. Et ils disent, un jour on reviendra. Mais il faut qu'on laisse des traces de ce qu'on a fait. Il faut qu'ils aient des preuves, quand ils seront capables de comprendre, de ce qu'on a fait. Et ils donnent les, les, les grandes religions qui disent toutes la même chose, qu'un jour ils reviendraient, quand nous serions prêts quand nous commencerions à échapper au monde primitif, à ne plus nous agenouiller et prier devant tout ce qui vient du ciel, mais à utiliser notre cerveau et dire comment ça marche. Et, et c'est ce qu'on fait maintenant. Dans les 20 dernières années, on a découvert plus de choses que dans toute l'histoire de l'humanité. Dans les 10 années qui viennent, on va découvrir plus que dans ces 20 années et tout ce qui a précédé. Puis ensuite, en 5 ans, en 2 ans et demi, en un an, en six mois, en trois mois, et à un moment donné, en une journée, on trouvera plus que dans toute l'histoire de l'humanité. Et ça, c'est pas, si vous ajoutez 10 ans, plus 5 ans, plus, on arrive aux environs de 2025-2030. Donc là, demain, dans 15-20 ans, on va tout savoir. Et là, ils peuvent envisager de revenir. Rael was chosen by the aliens to bring us the message of their second coming. They asked him to build an embassy where they can land and meet the press and our world leaders. Il souhaite que l'ambassade, si possible, soit construite près de Jérusalem. Pourquoi euh, Parce que le premier laboratoire où ont été fabriqués les premiers hommes, Adam et Ève, était situé près de Jérusalem. Donc, sentimentalement, ils aimeraient revenir à cet endroit-là où tout a commencé pour, euh, en fait, boucler la boucle. Alors, on a demandé euh, de nombreuses fois au gouvernement israélien l'autorisation. Ce n'est pas une question de moyens mais l'autorisation d'avoir cette extraterritorialité pour construire ce que la tradition juive appelle le troisième temple, justement qui doit être bâti par le Messie, Messiah, et, et pour accueillir Elohim. Et donc, euh, effectivement, certains rabbins euh, se posent des questions. 
à savoir si, si effectivement, ce ne serait pas moi. Et ils ont bien raison de se la poser. The discourse about technology is not a rational debate anymore. The prospect of a transhuman era affects us all. Most conflicts will probably occur in the cultures that are influenced by the biblical tradition, where humans are granted a central role in the universe. After the first taboo, that the Earth is not the center of the universe, and the second, that we originate from apes, which is still not digested, we are now confronted with the last taboo, that we are not the end of evolution. But whether and how this further revolution will take place still remains, at this moment at least, a human, perhaps all too human, decision. We may be on the threshold of acquiring godlike capacities. However, we will only, at best, through the agency of technology, become two-thirds the deity as described in the great biblical tradition that has been the inspiration of the Western world for thousands of years. That is to say, we may reach toward a kind of omniscience, we may reach toward a kind of omnipotence. Those are two facets of the divine according to the great tradition. But technology is never going to be able to transform us into uh, divinely loving, merciful, or compassionate beings. That part, the moral dimension of our technological deification, remains a problem, remains a choice remains a uniquely human challenge. And in that sense, technopolis does not change human history. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.